and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Well, semi-newcomer, technically. The head of Magic Gal Media and the, cur and the current creator of Black Rhapsody, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one and only Miss Serena. Hello, thanks for having me back, or having me on, actually. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Tr a little behind the glass thing for the rest of you. We had tried this a little bit earlier in the month, but... Um, technology got in the way. And I, f I, fig I figured we tr I figured we try and reschedule. We almost had to delay it again because Mother Nature decided to get in the way this week. But fortunately, that has not been the case. So, as I under as I as I understand it. When I when I seen the pre-launch, one of the, the way it was described was um, Madoka Magica meets some meets some aspects of Berserk. Yeah. But before we get before we get into that, I'd kind of like to go into the humble the humble beginnings. Um, okay. You and we meant we you got into. As I recall correctly in our conversations, you got into anime um, in the early 2000s. Yes. Um, was it a, was oh. it a case of watching blocks like adult like Adult Swim at the time, or was there a dip, was there a different route? Uh, yes, Adult Swim. That's how I learned about Inuyasha. That's how I got into Inuyasha it was through Adult Swim, mm -hmm. and as well as Cartoon Network mm -hmm. and other um, networks that ran anime. Or I grew up in the era of four kids TV, if you remember that. My sympathies. <laughs> yeah, I got to a lot of anime um, through four kids as well. Just whatever it was airing. Mm -hmm. Which is understandable, but still my sympathies because, well, all crit everybody's got their whipping boys and four kids slash 4K media slash whatever they're calling themselves to stay ahead of the law this week. Will always be one of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, especially since I would I I was at I was at the I was at the New York Comic Con the one t the one time he got in tr he got in trouble with the Public Library Association. Um, he by he I mean um, Al Khan, the head the head of Four Kids. Oh. See, it said in the middle of a he had said in the middle of a pa panel or something that kids don't read, and he got hissed at by some of the audience. Wow. He tr he tried to he tried he tried to backtrack later, but there's a, there's a little bit of fun history. Um, certainly a, certainly a laugh for me to see it, if o if only because I I had to put up with the whole. We need to make we need to make anime more Western attitude that he had. You look how that how, how well that went. Yeah, but given given that given that the big reason that I the big reason that I asked if Adult Swim was the entry is I was curious if there if there was a particular movie or particular DVD or, or what have you that that pushed that pushed you into going further down into the rabbit hole? Uh, most of the stuff was usually stuff that I well, most kids watch during that um, time. I did stumble upon during my middle school years. I stumbled upon um, I think in demand like an anime section Call entertainment on demand or something along the lines. Um, it was probably the Anime Network. I know that I know that yeah. they were doing that. At, I know that ADV was doing that at the time. Yeah, because I started. That's where I started going straight down into the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. 
I'm watching Princess Resurrection, Petite Princess Yushi. Yep. Now, else was out. Damn, that's 50 years. <laughs> Ano was another one. Mm-hmm. Ninja uh. some. I don't, I don't remember. It's been years. Ninja Nonsense, I think it was called. Mm-hmm. But what I find what I find interesting is the is the mix that you're going with of of, le- of leaning a little bit into ma- a little bit into magical girl and a little and a little bit into um, horror, and yeah, that's where we that's where it's a good segue to bring in uh, Madoka Magica. How did you for, how did you first come across that and what? What struck what struck you about it that it and um, served it and served as an inspiration? Uh, I remember a friend in high school telling me about Madoka, but at the time I wasn't too interested in it, just because mm-hmm. I had other things. I was more focusing on my studies at the time. Mm-hmm. Not until I entered college, so a few years later, that I finally checked out Madoka because I was hearing I was hearing good things about it. And one of the things that struck me is how well it was able to pull off the uh, the dark aspect of the series. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know if you know about the show, but in yeah. the, uh, the girls, the magical girls, are the enemy. They're the witches. Mm-hmm. Magical girls become witches, and it becomes this like repeating cycle. A girl becomes a magical girl, makes a wish, falls into despair, and becomes a witch. And it was, it was like, wow, that's it turns out it's something that I don't think any show had done was the reveal of the main villain was actually the cute pet familiar in every magical girl series. Mm-hmm. If you're familiar, if you're uh, familiar with that show, yeah, you know, every, like the cute pet, they made that that the end. And it's also that never been done. Mm-hmm. Um. Although, although when it comes to Cube and I've, I um, I had talked to, I had talked about this on the podcast a long time ago, where I, where I was comparing um, oddly enough, Monica Magica to Evangelion in the sense of reconstruct in the sense of deconstruction deconstructing certain subject matter. Yeah. Because Ava, on some re- on some regards, want wanted to be a deconstruction of the super robot um style of mech anime especially the stuff especially the stuff coming from the 70s and to a certain extent deconstructing some of the concepts of ultraman and monica magica is very clearly deconstructing the magical girl genre and the whole thing with that with that episode was discussing why one deconstruction worked and the other one didn't yeah, because I see a lot of Mia try to do, especially Western Mia, try to do deconstruction, but just do it wrong. Um, the there's a, when it comes to Western media trying to do deconstruction, there are always two properties that come that come to mind. Um, one of the one of them. Of course, of course, is Watchmen. This the case, yeah. Which I will admit, I'm not the biggest fan of of Alan Moore. I do, th- I do think he is a bit up his own ass. I agree. Uh, uh, and I get, and at some at some point, I'm like, I get it. You're a nihilist. I. That's why I always say that his best work wasn't Watchmen; it was Hellblazer. I.e., the thing he wrote. Ju- the thing he wrote and drew just so he had an excuse to draw Sting. Okay. But the other, the other, the other um, property they consider a a Western attempt at deconstruction is this might this might seem a bit odd, but Scream. And oh, okay, okay, yeah, nah, yeah. Why say why scream? If I may ask. Scream felt like an attempt to do a ritual burning of a lot of the tropes that we were, that we saw throughout the eighties and nineties of the slasher villain. 
And how appropriate that we're discussing this on Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem with trying to be that recon that that ritual burning, especially with how if you look back at the original movie, there there are moments where they go into excruciating detail about the rules of a slasher movie, like that knowing having seen so many of them that they have the they have the rules and the cliches down to a science. Part of the reason that I consider both of the both of them failures is what is not only what came after, but what lessons people learned from it. Um, like with with Watchmen, you had people you, well, you had people trying to take darker turns and and showing that the heroic figures weren't that heroic. And with with Scream, you had a bunch of people acting like they were genre savvy. Uh, um, if I may ask, mm -hmm. would you consider? Are you familiar with the boys? Garth Ennis, the boys. I am. Would you consider that like a deconstruction, a failed deconstruction, or a successful one? Um, because <sighs> personally, I see it as a failed deconstruction. Okay, let me let me narrow this down. Are are you asking me regarding regarding the comic or regarding the Amazon series? Uh, comic. Okay. Well, first off, I will admit I'm not the biggest fan of Garth Ennis' work, putting aside his work on Superman. I would say that I would say that the boys is perhaps a bit, perhaps a bit too is a bit too cynical for its own good, and I do I do see why you'd consider it a failure of a, of a deconstruction because the problem that if because with all three of these you do have a bit of a pattern, um, showing the failings of a certain of a certain tro of a certain trope without presenting anything to build it to build it back up or just showing the failings on its own even with some even with something like um like Ma like Madoka, it doesn't it doesn't out it doesn't try and act it doesn't try and act like the genre it's deconstructing has has little value once you once you peel back those surface elements I think that's where I think that's where the difference lies, and the bo the the deconstruction that I think the boys was trying to do was just the was the commodification of superhero culture, commodification and cor and corporatization, but it doesn't do a whole lot beyond that, and it's still falling into the same trappings that Watchmen did, which is why it could be considered a failure in that regard. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, also, evil Superman is something I'm kind of sick of. I agree. <laughs> it's been done to death. And it's... I don't want to. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but I look at Eve, I look at the the quote unquote popularity of Evil Superman among some writers. To be to be a ref, to be a ref, to be a, a um, reflection of a complete misunderstanding of that type of character. That's not to say that a Superman like character can't be evil, but. The problem that the problem that I have is that the evil that it ends up being is the same. Whether whether it's Homelander from the boys, whether it's um, whether it's whether it's Omni Man, or 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 Superman in Injustice, it's all all three of them are essentially telling the same story. And the and the same kind and the same kind of evil Superman. That's in a roundabout way. That's where my problem is with the concept. Okay. 
No, I completely agree with you. I have some more issues with that. Mm-hmm. Because you look at all three of them, and it's it's basically telling the uh, the story that I keep that I keep hearing among people who don't understand Superman for most of my life. That if Superman existed in the real world, he'd be a he'd be a asshole on a power trip. Yeah. I mean, Omni Man is slightly better in this in the in the fact that you have the family relationship issue that issue that's going on with Invincible, but one per, but one percent above zero isn't exactly that much of an improvement. Oh. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not an old school purist like some like some of my colleagues. I do understand the value of dark of dark heroes, but I think there has to be a method. Um, mm-hmm. Which, speaking of dark, that's a. It's also amusing that in the pre-launch you had brought up um, Berserk, which is certainly a dark fantasy, but one that but one that doesn't fall into. The trap, the trap that could easily happen when making a darker take on a, on a certain storytelling style. Because mm-hmm. ultimately, I in that re- in that regard, what what was your what was your introduction to Berserk, and what was it that um, struck out at you? Th- to serve as inspiration for um, Black Rhapsody. My introduction to Berserk was through some of my friends, like, discussing it. Mm-hmm. I checked it out myself, and it was very interesting manga, a manga, because unlike most dark stories where they just throw just horrible stuff happening to the character, it just had to be, like, for shock value. Berserk does it in a way that it, it, there is shock value, but it's meaningful. It does have, like, an effect on the story. It goes back to a discussion I was having with one of my friends about dark versus edgy. Berserk is dark. The Boys is edgy. It just has horrible shit happening in The Boys that are just for shock value. It doesn't have much of an effect on the story or the character. Which That brings up an interesting question. What would you say is the dividing line between dark and edgy? The dividing line is whether the horrible stuff or like the really like awful things that happen to the character actually has a purpose or that it like drives them. It actually has a purpose or does it, does it serve the purpose to the story and how does it affect the character? I would say that there's a difference because with edgy, it's just. I'm going to have to use a manga that I read, that I read recently, that is edgy, would be Magical Girl's Sight. Like, I looks, haven't read that. Yeah, it's basically Madoka. If it failed to understand what Madoka was, it literally opens up with this young girl being bullied, and she's implied to be suicidal. But the thing is, it doesn't give you a reason to like the character. Like it, it tries to use like horrible stuff happening to a character as an excuse for pity, and it mistakes pity for liking the character. While as in Madoka, the main character Madoka actually has at least some type of likable traits. It doesn't just fall into the despair moment right off the bat in the first few episodes. You get mm-hmm. to know Madoka as a character and understand why the characters like her. Now, a bit of Madoka is kind of a blind as a character, but that's just me. Mm-hmm. And but with Aya Asagiri, the main character from Magical Girl's side, you don't have a reason to like her. Don't, like, the first few pages is her just going through complete and absolute hell. And her just being, like, self-peeing and, and suicidal. Like, okay, this is a very shitty world that she lives in. I have no reason to be invested right off the bat. You understand? Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring that up in comparison with someone with someone like Guts. If you don't, if you don't mind me bring um, referencing this for comparative sake, because 
I love contrast. <laughs> um, Guts has had plenty of horrible stuff. Has had plenty of horrible stuff happen to him. He was sent. He was a co- he was a coffin birth. His mother was already. De- his mother had already been hanged when he when he was born. Um, and Gambi- there was the whole thing with Gambino, the pr- the closest thing to a parent that he had. He, the whole thing of him being known as the struggler, but by by, uh, by other people is an a- is an apt descriptor of him. But there isn't really a sense to a set for. It isn't really done for a, a case of pity, but more to beat it over your head that this is this is not a nice world to be in. It is a uh, it is a, a person. He's a even despite the horrible things that happen, he's still the fight on. Mm-hmm. He doesn't just give up and just self pities all the time. The closest the closest thing to to any sort of edgy would be. The Black Swordsman arc, when you don't really know a whole a whole lot with him, he just seems cynical. Yeah. And then after the, after the whole thing with the Golden Age, you get more context about how the Eclipse basically broke him, and the, and even trying even trying to pull himself back, he still has the temptation to go back to those to that broken state, which is. Represented by the black dog. Oh. And of course, I'm va- I'm vastly simplifying, but the the point w- the point with that is he fuf- he fulfills the role of a Byronic hero, whereas the character that you mentioned the character from that from um, site that you mentioned. Sounds like definitely sounds like a misunderstanding. I might look, I might look a bit further into it on my, on my own time. It's now, not the misunderstanding. I? It's like that's how the manga is. That's how she's portrayed as a victim of a horrible world. She's well, learning only. She's learning being abused by her brother. She's almost raped in the in the book. Like this is like the first chapter, by the way. Mm-hmm. Which I, what I was what I was saying is that it, is that I think it misunderstands um, how how to do, how to do a character that's in that dark, that's in a dark world. Yeah. Um, and to the to that. Uh, to that particular um, end, to that particular end, one thing one thing that I that I'm curious about is with is for is it that for that reason that you had um, Alethea, Alethea, the protagonist in Black Rhapsody, have the archetype of a, a rebel with a heart of gold, as you described it. Yeah. Uh, and for, further to go further into that, you had also written that sh- her mouth is quicker than her hands. Is is it a case where she where um her where her where she can she can get a bit spicy with some with some of her remarks and that gets her into trouble? Yeah. Let's just say that that might that's a plot point. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all I'm going to say. Which is is very fair, and the um, the other thing, the other thing that I, I find kind of interesting is describing uh, describing people turning to pop stars and musicians as a new form of re- a new form of religious worship. Uh, what what prompted that particular idea? Um, it was like a comic I was reading. I, I used to read a few years ago called "The Wicked and the Vine." Mm-hmm. Have you heard of that? I think I've heard. I remember seeing the. I remember seeing the name because I spend way too much time in bookstores. But 
Yeah, it had a concept where the gods, like gods from like real world mythologies, were like um, pop stars. Every ninety years, someone gets um. They don't really explain the whole system behind it. I mean, they do, but not very well. Mm-hmm. Essentially, every ninety years, a god is re- a person's reincarnated as a god of any pantheon, regardless of sexuality, race, and religion. They, but the problem is, they only have two years to live. After two years, they die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was an interesting concept. The problem is, holy crap, the writing was bad. Like, it was very pretentious, and the characters were just, like, like kind of bitchy for no reason. They weren't likable. It, it tries to do that unlikable millennial trope that you see in a lot of fiction. Mm-hmm. Hello? I'm still here. Oh. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. And it's it's one of those it's one of those things that I've seen I've seen my fair share of. And I'm, and I'm always like, okay, I get okay, I get it. You're unlikable. Can you do something else, please? Yeah. But it, it wouldn't be a problem with just one character, but when it's majority of your characters, it starts to grate. And I hate how they portray certain gods. Is it a, is it a case where they where they portray? Is it? It sounds like it sounds like somebody um, read through myths explained and did and missed the point. Yeah. I mean, I watch some Miss Explained videos, but at least I understand what they're trying to get at. I do further research on whatever deity I plan to tackle. And let me take a shot in the dark with with it. They did at least one joke about Zeus being a horn dog. They didn't. It's just that... Okay, hi, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can remember. The characters, they don't really do anything with the... Um, Deity, so other than giving the characters like magical powers, but one of the things I found interesting was how the characters would do these things called like um, what was it miracles? Mm-hmm. They use their yeah their powers are called miracles, and when they perform, their music like has an effect on people. There's this there's um the scene in um, Wicked and the Divine where um the guys Persephone. Who is the main? The main character is reincarnated as the goddess Persephone, and whenever she she's performing on stage, she's like inducing pain in people. There's this thing called she sings this thing called Persephone in Hell, a reference to the myth um her um well known mythology. You know how Persephone is mm-hmm. taken away by hate, is stuck in hell. Mm-hmm. But other than like um light references, they don't really go in depth with it. And one of the things I like about that page is how they treat they tie the mythology with the music. Their music, each god's music has a different effect. Mm -hmm. One god can basically turn an entire room into an orgy. Another god can basically uh, cause darkness to surround their audiences. Causing our audiences to fall into darkness, essentially. Another god can induce euphoria. That god is, as you know, Dionysus. If you know anything about mm-hmm. Dionysus, he's often popularly described as the party god. You know, the god of wine, the god mm-hmm. of revelry. Mm-hmm. So I did really like that concept, and that's where I got the whole myth with music concept. <laughs> Yeah, although I remember dis- I remember discussing it. the The approach that you ended up doing is that the is that it's more it's more of magic and music being not too far removed from each other. Yeah. Yeah, the gods like the the girls, the magical girls. Their music does 
is both their weapon, greatest weapon, and the greatest gift. Mm -hmm. They can use it to fight in battle, or that they can use it to uh, serenade an audience. But it's it sounds to me like one of the things you wanted to do with developing that kind of magic system is for it to be multi-purpose. Yeah. I.e., it's because the inspiration that you mentioned it sound it sounded like a the abilities that that were in that series was very. It had a strong concept, but the way it, but the way it's utilized was one note, a one trick pony, if you will. Yeah, they didn't go through go far with it enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it and when it comes to uh, when it comes to Alethea, uh, I think you I think in other places you had described it that a lot of her powers. Are, t are tied to the dead. Yes. Like her power is like, is tied to the person she's based on, which is Hecate. Hecate in Greek mythology is described as being the friend of the dead. She's not their ruler, that's Hades, but she's, she's kind of like, she has a close relationship with them compared to like Hades does. And Persephone, her and Persephone have like a close relationship to the dead. Mm-hmm. Out with Hecate in my story, my take on Hecate is that Hecate allows the dead through her song to have their justice, meaning that she's in front of a wrongdoer or someone who like committed an evil act upon, let's say, a victim. She can summon the dead with her song and let the and let and let that soul meet out their justice. It mm -hmm. takes like the necromancer concept, but tries to like do it in a way where she wouldn't be considered a sociopath. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, necromancers are oftentimes depicted as being evil for a reason. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't use the dead as like her weapon. She allows them the opportunity to seek out justice. And if she's in a crowd of people, she can have that that lost soul be reunited with their loved one one last time before they pass on. In in that regard, would it be fair to say that she's more akin to a sh a shaman than a necromancer? Um, I would say she still would be a necromancer because necromancers do deal with the dead. Because originally, like the Greek idea of necromancy was to communicate with the dead. Mm -hmm. Our modern idea of necromancy, which is heavily influenced by, I think the um. Judeo-Christian values of our society sees like uh, necromancy as controlling the dead, which is which is very much a fair point. Yeah, so I'm kind of using the Greek take on it. Mm -hmm. And with, given the, given. Since we've mentioned a whole lot when it comes to Greek mythology, is that where is is that where you focused a lot of the deities, or or when it came to the concept, is any mythology on the table? Any mythology, African, Egyptian, even ones from the uh, Cthulhu mytho, the Cthulhu mythos, which. Which brings me to brings me to something that was mentioned at the top of the um, Indiegogo page of a of um, a Lovecraftian pop star, which, i.e., um, Dul Dulcibella. Yeah. And the thing is, a lot of people utilize the term Lovecraftian in one form or another, and and in some cases, in some cases, misunderstanding it. Um. What, what do you, what in your mind makes Dulcibella Lovecraftian? I'll say, no one technically knows where Dulcibella came from. They they only know that she just popped out out of nowhere. I think it's the aspect of fear of unknown. People who see this like popular or pop star have no idea what she actually is. Because mm -hmm. like if you were to see her actual form. It will break your mind. 
which is why she takes on the form she does in the um in the story like a more humanoid form mm-hmm. which that would cer- that would certainly be ap- that would certainly be apropos um I've I've talked about this in the past, but a lot of uh, there a lot of folks who bill themselves as having Lovecraftian themes, it ends up being very clear that they've only tangentially read um, the Cliff Notes of Call of Cthulhu and little else. Especially yeah. since Lovecraft's work, even though it's li- even though it has horror leanings, has far more in common with weird fiction. Weird fiction. Yeah, because, because a lot a lot of the a lot of the stories aren't really are. There's certain there's certainly about some of the horrible things and the horrible things in, within the unknown in space, but the reason why I say weird fiction is because it's not the story isn't about the scariness of it. Even something like Call of Cthulhu, the it's this exploration of something that isn't right in the way that we see it. Like just the Baz relief from the from the original story goes into detail about how, about how uh, about how odd and unnatural the the design and the and the construction appears. Mm-hmm. Um, or you ha- or you have something like the shadow out of time where somebody it, where somebody is be- it is being possessed and had been possessed and is trying to figure out what exactly they were doing and saying during a period of time that they can't remember um I suppose in that regard it's it's not too far removed from the kind of storytelling you'd see in the Twilight Zone Mm-hmm. Or, actually, I suppose, I suppose a better example would be the Night Gallery. I both involving, both involving Rod Serling. The Night Gallery was a kind of spit, a kind of spinoff to the to the Twilight Zone, not necessarily connected. If in fact, the only thing that connects the two is Rod Serling's involvement, but. It w- but it was far less science fiction adjacent than the Twilight Zone was, and ex- and had some more experimental concepts. It was, it it wasn't as successful, but it had but it's had a bit of a cult following over the years. Now, one of the other one of the other things. I think I think I talked with you about this previously. Was the fact that different magical girls represent different musical styles? Mm-hmm. Oh. In that regard, what's what musical style would you say Alethea is representative of? Um, ethereal way, specifically the. Uh, it's hard for me to describe. If you know anything about the cop two twins, she takes a lot of inspiration from them because they're the most well known example of of that genre she's based off. Because mm-hmm. if you were to if you were to listen to Ethereal Wave, you could hear like synthesizers, but it's like more of a droning type noise. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I, I will have to show you the actual music for me to describe this better. Oh, uh, la- later on, later on, you later on, um, you can you can send me a few because I will admit when you mentioned that you mentioned that for whatever reason the name that immediately came to mind was the Crux Shadows and I knew I was wrong on that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but um, the vocals of the third way usually has very like ghostly, almost atmospheric vocals, like. Like like a ghost singing. In, ghost. That, in that regard, the way you're describing it, it sounds. I'm ju- I'm just doing this interpretation with stuff that I'm a little more familiar with. It sounds like it's accomplishing the same goal electronically that um, 
that genre is like Funeral Doom. Try to. Um, I'm not for it, Funeral, Funeral Doom. Doom is a uh, is an offshoot of doom metal. Um, that tends to be that tends to be longer, droning and more atmospheric. Um, a couple of big examples of that are Earth and a and um, Ahab. Mm-hmm. I'm not that educated on that. <laughs> uh, everybody's got to learn somehow, and I and I've always had a never stop learning approach. So so there's that. But when it com- but when it comes to the when it, when it comes to the story of Black Rhapsody, um. Are you ch- is even though this is essentially chapter one? Um, do you intend on using? Do you intend on going through a kind of hero's journey path with the story? Yes, especially with the main character herself. Yeah. And I'm and given the fact that you're go that you have that hero's journey, I'm get I'm guessing that even someone as rebellious as she has has a circle of friends that they rely upon. Mm-hmm. And while while obviously obviously um, Dulcibella is the is the big bad of the whole, of the whole story. I'm guessing that there that there are other characters you have planned as being as being antagonists on a lower tier, in order to avoid the um, what I what I have to call the Moriarty problem. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. What do you mean by the Moriarty problem? Um, it's a it's a reference to Professor Moriarty from Sherlock Holmes, and how in the final in the in the story the final problem. Which was supposed to be the end of the sh- of Sherlock Holmes stories, but actually wasn't. Long story. It's revealed that all of the ca- that all of the cases that Holmes had been doing up until that point were on s- on some level connected directly or indirectly to Moriarty in a all roads lead to Rome kind of thing. And. The reason why that's a problem is that it is you end up flattening the world that you create, where everything that happens to that point all is supposedly the fault of one mastermind. No, no mastermind, no matter how smart, can be capable of that much. If I have to use a more contemporary example, consider the consider Xanatos and gargoyles. I never watched gargoyles. Oh. Just in that sense of ev- of everything's being tied to that to that one person, you can do you can do that with cer- you can do that to a point, but eventually it becomes a bit of a stretch. And Me- that's what that's why I'm asking if if there if there are other rivals or ant- or antagonists, so that it's not all relying on Dulcibella carrying all the weight. Okay, yes, that I understand. Yes, there are going to be other rivals, some of which are connected to Dulcie Bella, but they're more independent of themselves. Mm-hmm. Without spoiling a part of the story, there's a character that, like, with some of these singers that I have working on the Dulcie Bella, there are a theme that I have with them is that they're based off of these very horrific goddesses, some of which mm-hmm. come from. The Cthulhu myths are some of which come from other parts, other cultures, and they each kind of like acts as a, like a dark antithesis to one of the girls. Mm-hmm. For the one that's like based off of, let's say, uh, nature. Like I had, I've spoken about a magic girl that I planned to do that was based on Afro soul. Mm-hmm. Her rival character would be someone who is basically a literal, let's say, parasite of nature. I plan to make that cat either based off of a, uh, either Shub Nigroth or Ghidra. 
because both of them are earthbound goddesses, but they're like evil. Specifically, Ghidra, who is more, she's more like a female version of Nero Lethotep, where she will actively try and mess with humans. Mm hmm. And she can take the life force of others and, like, um, add it to her own. So she's basically a walking life parasite, almost like a cancer on mm -hmm. nature itself. Oh, yeah. But that's, like, a character I've been, like, playing with. It could change in the final product. Mm hmm And within that, what are you... Sh when you meant when you mentioned de when you mentioned deity deities serving as serving as antithesis, um, as well as as well as ones that are not that are nods to the Cthulhu mythos, um, I will give you your props for not going for not using Cthulhu because that's way too obvious. I know. <laughs> I'm going um, to do my and actually think outside the box, but. Have but have you have you considered you have you considered adding um, someone like Yog Sagoth onto the short list of that? No, I I want it to be like like female deities in the Cthulhu mythos. Mm -hmm. Yog Sagoth is a male deity because he is the father of um, Wilbur Wheatley. Mm -hmm. In uh, and the um the mature core, so I don't I don't want to use him. I might use him. In some other, um, some part of the story, but not as a rival to some of the magical girls. Yeah, and I was I was going to bring up the Migo, but I, but I don't think that would qualify either. No. And with that with that in mind, where would you? The I will admit that when you were that um when you were mentioning de when you're mentioning deities that that could act as some sort of antithesis, this might be this might be the Norse in me, but I ended up thinking of hell. Hell? Yes, with one L. I mean I can open she is the um the Norse goddess of the underworld. Mm-hmm. Why her specifically, if I may ask? Um, I'd say if it, I'd say part, I, part of it was intuition, I guess, but there is also the also the possibility of some of because of how you describe. Um, I described Al Alethea's powers. What ended up coming to mind is the li is the line between so between justice and vengeance. Because mm -hmm. it's very it's very easy for one for one to go for one to go into the other, and so and the idea the idea of someone. Wishing to wishing to settle grudge, wishing to inflict har inflict harm on those on those who supposedly wronged them instead of, instead of instead of meeting out justice in any in an even fashion is a, is a a story in contrast. I did say earlier that I love that I love contrast, and that might be me projecting a bit too much of. My own style in, into that kind of thing. Just it was just something I thought I'd throw out there. Interesting. And that would be a good contrast out of the. Mm -hmm. I'm looking up notes, uh, stuff about hell, and she's described as being like rather a cruel goddess who is indifferent to both the living and dead. Mm -hmm. It doesn't Which have is to, yeah, and it doesn't have to be her specifically, but some, but somebody who is far, but just somebody who is far more vengeful. 
I was going to use like as a contrast to Althea um, Maloney, who is basically the vengeful daughter of Persephone. Basically, Persephone was raped by Zeus, and upon the loss of her virginity, she gave birth to uh, to Maloney. Mm-hmm. Uh, vengeance spirit, the goddess of nightmares and insan- insanity, whose scream can drive those that hear her to utter madness. Mm-hmm. It's cer- it's certainly a po- it's certainly a possibility. Yeah, I'll have to do more research. And I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure you, I'm pretty sure you you along with several of the people I've had in the temple have a research pile of of sorts that they that they go into. I do. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. I'm just as guilty. And some people have some people's research piles are certainly bigger than others. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a as far as a page count for Black uh- Rhapsody Part One? Black Rhapsody Part 1, 35 pages, mm-hmm. plus bonus content. Mm-hmm. So 35 pages of the main story. And then, and then, and then, ex- and then extra pages regarding, well, extras. Mm-hmm. And what are you, and with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se but a but a window um i hope to get it fulfilled or at least done within a few months Mm -hmm. but i will have to see how that works with my rs's schedule because my rs is sick at the moment and she can't do as many pages as she wants to as before unfortunately Mm mm-hmm I'm still in talks with her to try and figure something out. All right, and I'm I'm confident that so, that it will it will work out one way or the other. And I do look forward to seeing how it how it develops with time. And as as a bit of an aside, congratulations on managing to get fu- get funding so quickly. Thank you. Because it's. It's only it's only been it's only been up for less than a week, if by my recollection. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for <laughs> taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the madness at play here. And. Oh. Go ahead. I was gonna say thank you. And any time you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!